Hello everyone and welcome to Slash Film Daily. Today is Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. On today's episode of the show, we are going to gather around the virtual water cooler and talk about what we've been up to. My name is Ben Pearson. I'm an editor at SlashFilm.com and I'm joined on today's episode by Slash Film editor, Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. Jacob, how's it going? Uh, it's going. It's one of those, it, it's, it's CinemaCon week for those of you who don't work in our industry, which means you have a writer on the ground in Las Vegas ready to see a bunch of footage from coming movies. That means those of us at home have to strap in for some late nights. Uh, so <laughs> I feel like this has been just my past week of mental headspace has been worrying about CinemaCon. Yes. Uh, well, I just wanted to follow up on something that I talked about, I guess it was Friday's episode of the show. Um, my wife was in the hospital for a, a good while. A couple of weeks ago, she had what was supposed to be a simple outpatient surgery, and she seemed to be okay immediately after that. But pretty quickly, we realized that something was wrong. She had a fever, and so we called the doctors, and they told us to go to the emergency room. And they gave her some medication and took some blood samples and sent her home. And that was a Monday night. And like days later on Saturday night, they called her back and they were like, oh, it looks like those blood samples we took are actually kind of concerning. So you're going to need to come back to the emergency room. And after we got there, we were informed that she'd actually had sepsis for an entire week. Um, I think it was because she had uh, ultimately we discovered she had an infection in her liver. So long story short, they had to like run a bunch of tests and they figured out this whole thing about the infection. And we spent nine days in the hospital while they treated her and tried to figure out what the heck was going on. So thankfully she's home now as of Monday night. Um, but man, like sepsis is no joke and it was a, a pretty rough stretch for a while there. So she's feeling a little bit better now and, and there are still like weeks of treatment ahead of her. So I'm hoping that she starts improving quickly and feeling better and all that. But like, I know it's cliche to talk about like being thankful for your health and all that, but man, she was like, she was perfectly healthy before this happened. And when something like this goes down, it's like really, I mean, it's, it's really scary. It can, it can pull the rug out from underneath you. So I would just say for anybody out there listening, like try your best to appreciate what you have while you have it. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's all I want to say about that. But, um, well, well, Ben, I'm complaining about being stressed out by cinema con planning and you're complaining about being stressed out by a genuine bona fide health scare for a person who's most important in your life. So a way to make me feel like a jackass. <laughs> well, I am also uh, stressing out about sending the con. So, you know, we're both in the, we're in the same boat there. So, um, okay. So on a much, much lighter and brighter slash technically darker note, Jacob, uh, tell me about what you did um, earlier, earlier this week. Yeah, like a lot of people, I watched the eclipse um, when, when that happened. Yes, I guess we're recording this. Is, uh, it was April 8th. And I'm very fortunate. A lot of people traveled a long time to be in the path of the of, of this eclipse because it was such a big deal. People, I know that a million people came to the Austin area, and the mayor had to declare a state of emergency, and it was just absolute chaos. Like, just didn't, didn't know, not want to leave my house uh, at all. But thankfully, from where I am in my house just north of Austin, uh, we were not only in the path of the eclipse, but we got totality for four and a half minutes. Uh, and a lot of places in Texas had cloudy days. The clouds parted a half hour before it started. It was like just meant to be. So we, my wife and I went, went out to the backyard with our, with our eclipse glasses. Uh, about hour, but, but when, when the initially started, it was eerie because I, every single bird in our neighborhood just started screaming. <laughs> just all the birds <laughs> went crazy. Uh, and then it started getting you know getting dark and dark. You look at the eclipse glass and you see like you know the, the moon going in front of the sun. Uh, and then when the totality happens and the sun is blocked and everything is so dark and I've never experienced anything like it. It was one of the most surreal and eerie things I've ever felt. Like it, I, I, you hear all these stories and legends about like how ancient peoples must have reacted to eclipses, and it went, it goes beyond just the sky getting dark. It, it is, man, it. it it made me think about the universe in ways I usually don't think about the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, it was truly unreal. Ben, was there any eclipse action at all in Florida? Not really. Um, I think there's some, somebody said something like there was 50 or 60% or something like that. But I honestly, like I was in the hospital and didn't even bother looking. Um, I was like, I'll just wait 20 years or whatever the next one is and then try to check that one out. And hopefully I'll be a, a little bit better equipped to, to um, experience that next time around. But um, I think my mom said that she, uh, 
she told me that she had eclipse glasses and she was looking and, and saw you know something but i i don't think it was anywhere near what you guys saw sort of in the in the middle of the country like along that line yeah i mean just once it what does fully happen four and a half minutes just a that dark hole in the sky with a little rim of light around it you see so many pictures of that and like i've never seen it in reality an eclipse that extreme and i don't know man it 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 was truly incredible, like an unforgettable thing to see. But like, it's it's the kind of image that makes me lie awake at night, and I, and I, it like with something in my heart, and I don't know what that something is yet. I don't know if I'm making much sense here. <laughs> yeah, you are. I mean, it sounds like it's a, a pretty profound experience. And I I listened to a couple podcasts and and heard similar stories from people saying like how it really like leaves an impact and kind of like shakes you to your core uh, in in some ways. So like. I mean, at the very least, it should um, help us not worry that much about CinemaCon, Jacob, because like you know <laughs> we're, we're pretty small in the grand scheme of all this. So uh, that that should be a, a reminder from the celestial bodies that we shouldn't take this crap too seriously. You know, that's good. I, I speaking of taking things seriously, a few weeks ago I talked about uh, my new uh, running regimen. Uh, I've been doing a lot of five k races, and you know, just been hitting up the gym a lot recently. And I joked that. Uh, I need to not talk about the podcast because if I talk about thing on the podcast, I, I it's a failing for me. Um, but I ended up running that 10K race I, I teased. I, I ran the uh, Austin's Cap 10K, um, which is a race through downtown Austin. And I don't, I don't know um, how, what the general like consensus, like what, what people outside of Texas think Texas looks like. Uh, but like West Texas is indeed very very flat, but Central Texas is incredibly hilly, and Austin is built in the hill country and. Uh, everybody warned me that Austin's Cap City 10K race was extremely hilly. And I said, yep, it'll be a pain in the butt, but I'll do it. And I did do it. And it was by far the hardest thing I've ever done physically in my life, Ben. And I know that people, you know, people run marathons, people run ultra marathons. So it's like, you know, piece of cake for like experienced runners. But I've only been running for, you know, four ish months now. And this wrecked me. I've never felt as physically defeated as I did by this. But I, but I did finish it. And my goal was to finish it in under 90 minutes and i did finish it in under 90 minutes so, oh nice that's awesome uh so but there are some hills that i've driven hundreds of times in my car but i've never had to run them until this and let me tell you um i will never take for granted those hills ever again like, holy, <laughs> holy cow um so yeah I, i've booked another 5k for, for a couple weeks from now and i have another 10k next month so keeping it rolling uh here like and i got i, I gotta either talk about it every time on this show now or just stop talking about it but i think i'm gonna just keep talking about it <laughs> excellent so uh, how is the weather out there because like texas obviously famously a, a very hot uh, part of the country um we are in april so did you have w- was it like okay was it tolerable out there no yeah, it was a pretty steady like between 65 and 70 degrees from, from my duration of the run it, it, it warmed up in the afternoon um but uh yeah, I, I definitely think I'll be running fewer outdoor outdoor daytime events uh, as the summer hits. But yeah. um, most of the stuff I've run so far has been in, in milder weather or in the morning. So uh, we'll see how things go. But um, I know I was looking at like June races, and like one June race is like at night. I'm like, okay, that may be the option. If we're, yeah, if we're keep, I want to keep this up. <laughs> Yeah, I've had people encourage me to try to do some of the races and stuff that are around me in Florida and like. Yeah, the weather just kind of keeps me. I I run a little bit um, at home, but I have a treadmill, and so running inside with air conditioning, I'm like, yeah, this is the way to go for me. So uh, I don't know if I'll be brave enough to to take it outside at any point. But um, but yeah, that's only awesome. Do, only do events where you get a shiny medal. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll only do running events where they give you a, where they give you a treat, but it's over. I'm not doing that. That's my rule. Is if if it's just you know uh, if you, if you if, if one reward is a t-shirt and a sense and a sense that you did it, like nope. You got to give me a medal, man. So wait, hold on. I want to go do that. Run, text seat. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, uh, let's get into what we've been reading. I read a book called The Scapegoat by Daphne du Maurier, and this came out in 1957. It is about a lonely, I'm going to read from Wikipedia here, a, uh, in a bar in France, a lonely English academic on holiday meets his double, a French aristocrat who gets him drunk, swaps identities, and disappears leaving the Englishman to sort out the Frenchman's extensive financial and family problems. Um, that sounded really intriguing to me. Like this is one of those books where like I read the back and I was like, Oh man, I got to read this immediately. This sounds like really awesome. And then the actual experience of reading the book itself, like I was kind of disappointed with, I just thought like I was hoping that there would be a little bit more 
back and forth. I think I was envisioning more of like a, um, you know, the, the, the switch happening. And then like halfway through the book, those two characters meeting up again and, and getting into some conflict based on, you know, the, the switch and all the stuff that happens in the first half. But like, that's not really how the story plays out. It really does just follow the one guy in this scenario. And, um, I'm not going to spoil exactly what happens, but it, it's, it is mostly just one character stepping into another person's life who happens to look identical to him to the point where like he can trick family members and stuff into thinking that it actually was the same guy all along. Um, and I think this has been adapted into a movie a couple times. I've never seen those movies, but yeah, after reading the story, I'm just kind of like, ah, the, the story that I have in my head is so much more interesting based on the, you know, reading the summary on the back of the book than the actual book is. So I'm, I'm sure you've encountered something like that in your travels, Jacob, considering how much you've read um, and how, how voracious a reader you are. But, uh, but yeah, this, this was just one of those sort of like textbook examples for me of like, oh man, I just maybe built something up or, or maybe misinterpreted something on the back of the book to like put a good idea in the back in in my head that ended up not really being what the actual book was are you usually a daphne du maurier fan she's a blind spot of mine um i read rebecca and really loved that um and i've read i've read a book called the house on the strand i think i talked about that on the podcast a long time a couple years ago or something but i've not read much of her work i'm, I'm my wife is uh, rebecca is like one of if, if not her favorite book then like very very high up there um so i am slowly we we have i don't know six or seven demaria books in our house and i'm slowly gonna make my way through them but um this is one that i i really enjoyed reading rebecca and this one uh, i don't know I, again it could just be because of expectations but this is not one that i would recommend anybody starting with or like even prioritizing at all well, I have a copy of Rebecca, but I've yet to crack it open. So maybe that, oh, it, man. it's probably something I need to get around to at some point. Yeah, that's good stuff. So uh, the book is called The Scapegoat by Daphne du Maurier. Um, what have you been reading, Jacob? I read some uh, fiction and nonfiction. Start with the nonfiction, uh, Prisoners of the Castle by Ben McIntyre. I talked about Ben McIntyre briefly on this podcast before a couple of years ago because one of his books, uh, Operation Mincemeat, was made into a Netflix movie. That was not a very good Netflix movie, but the book is extremely good. Uh, McIntyre, he is a scholar of... Uh, World War II and Cold War espionage stories, usually with a focus on uh, European characters. Uh, but he's all nonfiction, and his goal is like you know to examine you know uh, spies and spycraft uh, and tell like really underreported or underseen stories. And in this case, Prisoners of the Castle is about uh, Kolditz Prison or Kolditz Castle in Germany, which was the uh, castle fortress that became the POW camp for. Um, uh, allied officers who were extreme high uh, flight risks, guys who uh, proved themselves to be extremely troublesome, who wanted to escape at all costs, who could not be kept by ordinary uh, or ordinary uh, prisons elsewhere in Europe. And naturally, it's, it's really funny. The dynamic is that one, one of the main honchos in charge of the prison is this uh, German uh, schoolmaster who is literally a principal of the school who actually really liked Englishmen and, and was looking forward to, you know, living in a castle with a bunch of what he thought would be, you know, respectable uh, officer English gentlemen. And uh, it turns out that if you put all the officers who want to escape in one place, they become the rowdiest group imaginable and make your life a living hell. So uh, <laughs> it actually it ends up being this really interesting dynamic. Like you can see how stories from Coldest Castle influence everything from The Great Escape to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hogan's Heroes. Like on paper, some of the escape plans and, and, and uh, that the officers cook up, try to escape, many of them successful, are utterly ridiculous. They're, they're truly like Looney Tunes cartoons. They, they get so extreme and so bizarre. And meanwhile, there's this, uh, you know, like, like literally the German headmaster educator who's like trying to keep a handle on all these officers. It literally has a sitcom setup. Uh, and as, as McIntyre notes in the text, a lot of these legends have been, you know, told as like, you know, Look at these uh, brave officers, you know, defeating the Nazis by cooking up these crazy escape plans. And the book uh, just says it tries to, like, really lend the reality to the situation, which was, yes, there was truly crazy escape plans. And there was really wild stuff happening. There's there's, there's stories in this book that made my jaw drop uh, by, like, how audacious the escapes were and how they managed to to communicate and get, get, get help from home. Like, there's an entire chapter about the guy who started, who uh, was put in charge of MI9 in England. Uh, whose job was to invent ways to smuggle escape goods into the prison via um, care packages from home. 
and and like the book talks about how like he was one of the, he's one of the main guys who influenced Ian Fleming to create Q in the uh, James Bond st- stories. Hmm. This stuff is so ingenious, uh, but also talks it goes in great detail about you know the racism and homophobia and um, mental illness that happens in a POW camp like this. And also it goes into great detail about the German characters, like the, the, the guy who we'll talked about this German headmaster turned soldier um, was not a Nazi. And he actually, to, he actually was not a Hitler fan and thought Nazis were really stupid. And like, one of the interesting like threads in the book is this guy trying his best to keep these soldiers from escaping like day to day, just looking for tunnels and gadgets and hidden stuff and come to this slow realization that is my country committing genocide? Holy shit, what's going on? And it, it ends up being this really fascinating thread where like he kind of, um, you get the full picture of everybody who worked and lived in Colbert's castle, you know, the, the German soldiers and the American, not American, the, the British prisoners. And I found it to be such a sad, it's so satisfying. Like, like it, it has the richness of a novel. It, it feels like it should be an HBO miniseries. Oh. Uh, I found this to be one of, the, I've read other um, Ben McIntyre books and enjoyed them, but Prison of the Castle is probably my favorite I've read so far. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, I don't even know what kind of follow-ups I have. I just kind of like want to read that myself now. Um, what else have you been reading? Uh, I read The Three-Body Problem and um, Halfway Through the Dark Forest by Shishin Liu, the uh, Chinese science fiction writer. Uh, it, of course, uh, Three-Body Problems just became a Netflix series from the Game of Thrones creators. And I'm trying to be very careful about, about, about how I'm reading these because the TV adaptation is a loose adaptation because uh, Shishin Liu is an old school, hard sci-fi writer. He writes from the POV of like an Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, uh, where most of his, these books are people sitting around tables talking about philosophy, uh, physics, you know, uh, and uh, d- diplomacy. The action happens largely off screen in his books. And like in the same way, like, you know, if you go read Isaac Asimov's foundation, um, those books are people sitting in rooms talking. And then they'll, they'll say like, then they'll say like months later, I, they come back to the rooms and say, oh, by the way, this happened um, between the, our two meetings. And they ascribe something really exciting and action-packed, but it doesn't actually happen on screen because the writer is very much more interested in the philosophy and the science behind that as opposed to, like, luxuriating on an action scene. Mm-hmm. And uh, a- Apple TV Plus's adaptation of the Foundation books does a good job of uh, foregrounding the action and while trying to keep it as smart as possible. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the TV show of Three Body Problem in a moment. Um, but I will say that it's somebody who's. It's been a minute for me since I've read any um, really hard science fiction like this, where like the focus really is on the actual science of it all. Um, but I was really captivated by Three Body Problem. And I think I like The Dark Forest even more, even though I haven't finished it quite yet. Uh, it's. I don't want to spoil the premise because the the, the the lead is very effectively buried. But if you know, if you read the back of the book, I'll tell you what happens. But I'm not going to say it here. Um, all I'll say is that's very big, very heady science fiction. Uh, very little, not great character work. Like these are not books you read because you want compelling characters or like you give you like the characters, like the main characters in the first book are barely even present in the second book. Like it, it, the characters are just vessels that, be, that, that have conversations about these scientific theories and concepts that interest Lou, uh, Sitchin Lou, uh, as a, as a writer. Uh, so this is not going to be, this is not Star Wars. This is even Star Trek. This is like, you know, if you really want like, some science, new science fiction. These are really compelling. And I'm finding the, um, the questions proposed in the second book to be even richer and darker and more unsettling. Uh, I, I was warned the second book was a real feel bad piece of science fiction. And it's really, it's really giving me like, I don't want to say an anxiety attack. Cause I actually suffer from anxiety attacks. So I don't want to make fun of that, <laughs> uh, but it's very anxious reading. And I'm, I, these are really incredible books so far. Wow. Okay. Excellent. So that's the three body problem. Let's take a break and then we'll be right back. All right, Jacob, I caught up with Slow Horses. Have you seen the show yet on Apple TV Plus? No, because I bought the first book and want to read it first. And I have my, my to read pile is like 100 books deep. And I just haven't had time. Oh, man. I know you love reading stuff before you watch it. But like, I kind of recommend just diving in with this because there's three seasons so far. And I think it only started in 2022. And there's already been three seasons of the show. And each ep- uh, each season is only, I think, six episodes or something like that. And man, this has quickly become like one of my favorite shows on TV. It's just so, so purely entertaining. Like I know that Gary Oldman has like a lot of problematic off-screen behavior and stuff like that, you know, associated with him. 
Um, so I, it kind of like pains me to say how great he is in, in the show because he is just so perfect as Jackson Lamb, who is the head of uh, Slough House. The, the whole uh, premise of Slow Horses is it's like there's a there's a group of MI5 agents who have screwed up and been relegated to this place called Slough House, which is just this sort of like off the beaten path, like um, this place where the losers go, basically, like anybody who is, is a fuck up or whatever, um, just basically gets kicked, you know, out of the main out, out of sight of anybody who matters and into this this uh, sort of administrative um job basically and jackson lamb is the character that gary oldman plays and he's this like disgusting looking guy who's just constantly like farting and like walking around it looks like he hasn't showered in days and he constantly like dresses down his employees and and insults everybody and everything but he's like incredibly good at his job he's like a former uh you know top tier spy and he's now in charge of these people who've just screwed up in in various ways uh over the course of their careers and so the whole show is this back and forth between like the the proper spies who are operating at MI5 and uh, getting into like these main, you know, the, these huge like sort of, uh, I guess, potentially global conflicts or whatever, or like true espionage stuff. And then these people in, in the slow horses who are or in, in Slough House who are nicknamed slow horses, who are just like the screw ups who get... Um, rolled in basically to uh, all these bigger issues. And there's a lot of like political infighting and stuff between these two groups and everything. And uh, Gary Oldman is sort of like lording over the whole thing. And he's always like, you know, three steps ahead of everybody. It's just really, really entertaining to watch. It's like incredibly uh, propulsive TV. It, the characterizations are all great. I just like, you know, you spend one episode watching the show and you're like, Oh, yep. I get it. Everybody has their archetype. I'm like fully in on this. It's so like, uh, drilled down and simple and knows exactly what it's doing. And it's just like incredibly efficient, effective, um, really entertaining storytelling. It's really funny. There's great action stuff in it. There's a gigantic action set piece at the end of season three. That's unlike anything that they did before. It's always kind of shifting and switching into what kind of spy show it is. Um, but man, I'm just like, give me all of this, like keep it coming and I can't wait to see the next season. I think they've already said that season four is supposed to come out at some point this year and they've uh, renewed it already for season five, which is great news. Um, Gary Oldman has said that he wants to keep playing this character like as long as they'll have him basically. So that's also great news. And I just hope that the show continues to um, be a constant in my life now because I'm, I'm so happy that I, uh, finally caught up with it. I'd heard so many good things from so many people, even like red carpet interviews and stuff that I'd saw, I'd seen on Instagram and stuff. Like all these celebrities were like, man, I'm, I'm catching up with slow horses. I'm like, all right, fine. I guess I'll just get around to watching this. Like I kind of begrudgingly moved it to the top of my queue. And I'm so happy that I did because uh, it's a new favorite. So I highly, highly recommend checking it out, Jacob. And I know that you've got a lot of things to read, but it sounds um, really good. Uh, I, I've been wanting to, I've been wanting to read and watch it. And Honestly, the, the premise sounds so much like a great Ben McIntyre book, just fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's based on, um, I think, Mick, uh, Mick Heron is the name of the author. And it's based on a series of books. And each season of the show is an adaptation of one of his books. And I think there's, I mean, there's many, many books in the series. So, or in the, in the franchise, rather, in the in the book series. So, um, yeah, I, I'm like highest possible recommendation if you're even remotely interested in like really entertaining spy stuff check out slow horses on apple tv plus um i also speaking of apple tv plus also watched the documentary steve with uh, an exclamation point after it um it's a steve martin documentary have you seen this yet uh no no i, I actually didn't realize it was streaming already <laughs> yeah that's the thing about apple tv plus man like there's really not that many people that have the service and they don't do a great job of advertising their stuff so i feel like a lot of stuff that comes on there just kind of like disappears into nothingness i'm not going to really talk about this um, very much on today's episode, but there's a new show on there called Sugar that stars uh, Colin Farrell that is like another, uh, it's like a modern private eye kind of show set in LA that's really interesting and really cool. And like, if you love movies, definitely check out Sugar. Um, but that's another one. They, they just kind of did a terrible job of of um, advertising that the show is out. So anyway, I didn't want that one to fall through the cracks. But Steve is a Steve Martin documentary. It's two documentaries that are like an hour and a half-ish long and Morgan Neville is the director behind it. He's directed things like Won't You Be My Neighbor and um, Roadrunner, a movie about Anthony Bourdain and 20 Feet from Stardom. And he's like a, a very popular 
uh, documentary filmmaker. And he does a great job here. The first half of this Steve documentary is about Steve Martin's um, career as a stand-up comedian um, from like all through, you know, it, it traces his, it, famously, he grew up uh, working at Disneyland and like developed an, uh, an affinity for magic. And it goes into all of that, shows like a ton of archival footage. And then uh, he transitioned into comedy after that um, and became like the biggest stand-up comic in the world at that point. And then essentially walked away at the from from the profession at the top of his game in like the, the early 1980s and then transitioned over into making movies full time from there. Um, and so the first half is like much more focused on the comedy stuff. And then the second part of the documentary is more uh, kind of piecemeal going through a lot of three amigos, planes, trains and automobiles, um, you know, parenthood, like all, all the sort of highlights of his uh film career over the years and there's a lot of like behind the scenes stuff of him interacting with uh martin short with whom he stars on um uh, only merged in the building which is on hulu um so yeah it's a it's just a very entertaining watch if you like steve martin at all if you're like even rem remotely interested in him as a personality or like where he came from because i didn't really know much about his stand-up career because obviously i was born uh after all of that was like a, a big cultural thing uh, then yeah, check this out. It's, it's called Steve, uh, exclamation point, And then it's uh, a documentary in two pieces and it is on Apple TV plus. Uh, let's see. Last thing I wanted to mention is, uh, the Curb Your Enthusiasm series finale was this past Sunday night. Um, are, are you a Curb guy, Jacob? I used to be. I've seen the first six seasons and I fell off when he, when he started like taking longer breaks. I had a, it was hard, it was hard for me to jump back on, um, yeah. but I, I, I used to be a Curb super fan back in the day, but it's, it's been a long time. Uh, I would recommend checking it out because I caught up with it during the pandemic for the first time and have just been like watching it all the way through and caught up and uh, watching, I think, the past two seasons live and um, just really, really solid stuff, like super funny. I'm not going to get into really what happens in case people haven't had a chance to see it yet. And, and I don't want to spoil too much for you, Jacob, although you've probably seen a lot of headlines talking about the main thrust of what the finale was about at this point. Yeah, um, I, I approved that opinion for peacefulslashem.com. I called the finale a cop out. Wasn't sure. Ah, how interesting. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of torn on that. I'll have to read that article. I, I saw that headline go up earlier, or that article go up earlier, but I haven't ch had a chance to read it yet. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm kind of torn on whether or not I think it's a little bit of a cop out, but I, I ultimately I think it's kind of a case of Larry David, the creator and star of Curb Your Enthusiasm, having his cake and eating it too, in kind of like a, the best. Uh, the best way, like a really, really entertaining way. Um, and the show just kind of like went out on its own terms and it's just in, in really funny fashion too. So um, a lot of times comedies, I feel like can do this thing where, especially long running comedies can do this thing where like, they're almost more, um, more sentimental or something, or like you've spent so much time with these characters that like the send off uh, the, the, narrative construction of the show is such that like the characters have to go their separate ways or like um, create a sense of separation in, in, between the main characters, the core group of characters that you've been following that mirrors what you, the audience are experiencing with the show as it ends. And I'll just say that the curb finale does not do that. So it doesn't have to worry about being accused of being sentimental or like, you know, um, changing the tone of what you'd expect. It's very much a, a true to itself, uh, kind of, um, exploration of Larry David's ridiculous personality or the, the fictionalized version anyway. Um, so just really, really entertaining stuff. I just wanted to give a, a quick shout out to, um, so many years of like pretty consistently great comedy writing and, uh, and improving considering the way that the show came together. So, um, Curb Your Enthusiasm, the whole thing's streaming on Max right now. And like I said, I, I just decided to give it a go, like right in, in 2020 when the pandemic started. Um, and I think even the early seasons hold up pretty well, um, especially if you like grew up watching Seinfeld, even if you're just vaguely aware of the structure of that show. Um, Curb does the same kind of thing, but uh, but just with a whole group of ridiculous new characters and stuff that that's really entertaining. So um, that's all I want to say about that. Jacob, what have you been watching? Well, as I alluded to earlier, I watched. Uh, I started watching Three Body Problem, the Netflix adaptation of uh, the, the Sishin Lu science fiction series. Uh, like with, uh, interestingly, like with Game of Thrones, uh, which is also the same people who made Game of Thrones made this show. 
uh, Dave Benioff and D.B. Weiss. Uh, the show is named after the first book in the series, even though the book series has a different name, so it gets kind of confusing kind of quickly. But Three Body Problem is an adaptation of uh, the first and parts of the second book, which is why I've um, it's kind of an, it's why I'm watching the show in slow motion right now. Is that I looked at when I finished the first book, I looked at the first season episode titles and realized that events from the end of the first book were happening much much earlier in the show than i expected and i now that i've start halfway through the second book i'm now realizing that characters and events from the second book uh occurred in the first season so if you're a prior person who's who tries to balance reading versus watching or knowing what to do just know that three body problem is adapting the entire trilogy in, in its own special way picking and shooting from across all three books as needed so I'm trying to get through as much of the second book as possible, watching this, this, this show one episode at a time. Uh, so with that said, I think this is an incredibly good show, Ben. I uh, as an adaptation, it's it's taking the material and expanding on it in really smart ways. Uh, like I said, the, the book is largely people in rooms talking, uh, and the characters aren't you know are, are mouthpieces for the science. So the show has to maintain what makes that science interesting while adding actual human drama. I think it's a really fine job. There's a lot of Game of Thrones veterans scattered throughout the cast. Uh, any times of Liam Cunningham sighting, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, Jonathan Price is here. Uh, not, not a Game of Thrones guy, but um, Benedict Wong, uh, getting to use his actual accent here, uh, and is the best character in the show and the best character from the books. Uh, he's awesome. Uh, I don't know. I don't like I don't want like with the Like with the books, I think this is kind of a show it's best gone into a little bit blind. Because uh, once you start to realize how the pieces come together, it's really satisfying. Um, like reading the book and realizing, oh, that's what's going on was was a really satisfying thing. So watching my wife watch the show and watching her assemble the pieces in the same way I assemble the pieces while reading the book has been really exciting. So um, I, it's genuine hard science fiction. Uh, the, the production values are outstanding. Uh, I'm still a Game of Thrones defender. I don't regret what time with that show at all, and I think that the narrative that db weiss and david benioff are idiots is really unfair I yeah think, i think that there's you can say what you want about, the, about that last season of game of thrones but those guys aren't stupid they aren't untalented they clearly you know are really sharp guys who know how to get a show this massive produced they've done it twice and the way that they've cracked the three body problem and the dark forest as books to make it work for tv is really smart and i am looking forward to finishing a second book so i can binge the rest of the first season you know without without spoiling anything excellent Have you watched this at all yet ben or are you gonna be playing it? no and i i don't know man i it's just one of those things that like maybe i'll get around to it if they have multiple seasons and i hear like great things i just kind of heard mixed things about it and i haven't read the book i was kind of like warned off of the book by it being like too heady or whatever but hearing you talk about it now i feel like i could probably handle it if i want to but it's just a matter of like you know, mixing it into the the list and stuff that I have of what I want to do and prioritizing it and all that. So I just kind of think I'm going to keep that one on the back burner for a while. But um, but I'm glad to hear that that you think it's at least an interesting piece of adaptation. So yeah, I, I will say that if you want to give it a shot, uh, the ending of episode two uh, uh, kind of drops the gauntlet. Like if the ending of episode two, episode two doesn't have you like interested in learn what happens next, it may not be for you. But I, I it's a really interesting adaptation choice because they actually move. A revelation up much earlier in the season than, than would have happened in the book mm-hmm. uh, but it's the right place in a tv show to say okay yeah it, this is i'm in like i remember how in, you, you've seen lost right yeah oh yeah you know how in an episode at the end of episode four uh we learned that Locke was in a wheelchair and like oh uh, yeah at, at that point you're locked in and saying okay i'm in for the rest of this that's, that's yeah it's episode two or three body problem like uh, either you're in or you're not when that happens okay and then you have one more thing you wanted to mention yeah i'll talk about the first omen real quick uh the first omen I remember I was talking to some of the team members about this. We both, we all kind of expected that Immaculate was going to be the hard R, nasty, you know, uh, Catholic uh, pregnancy, non horror movie of the year. And first Omen would be warmed over studio junk. Um, it turns out that we have two incredibly nasty, awesome, crazy Catholic non pregnancy horror movies of the year. Cause first Omen rules. Um, <laughs> I had so much fun with this nasty piece of work. It is um, just as uh, it's just as uh, button pushing as Immaculate was, but whereas Immaculate has that very, very modern, gnarly in your face, you know, it's a neon release, but for lack of a better term, A24 horror movie style going on. Uh, First Omen feels like it was torn out of the 70s. It has that extreme Rosemary's Baby, you know, original Omen feel to it. 
but it's just unrelenting. It, 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 very classically composed, very deliberately paced. And then when the, the violence and scares come, it's it's really shocking. Like like it it it, it really feels like it's a uh, like a movie like out of its time until it gets to the gore where it suddenly is like, oh my god, this really is a twenty twenty four horror movie. <laughs> um, I found this to be an absolute blast. It's a hoot. It has images in it that are absolutely deranged and. Uh, I couldn't be happier that Immaculate and the first Omen are in theaters together right now. You should you should absolutely double feature these things. They are, oh uh, man, if you're like me and you just like a good blasphemous horror movie, uh, first Omen and Immaculate are just like chef's kiss. What 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 a time to be alive! Yeah, I did miss both of these, but I am planning on doing a double feature. So that's the the thing that I have to look forward to uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, finally catching up on some stuff. So yeah, that sounds awesome. And um, if you or for some reason, just listening to this episode for the first time, uh, go back and listen to, I think, the, uh, this past Friday's episode of Slash Film Daily. We did uh, an interview. We had an interview with um, the director and one of the producers of the show, or of the of the movie, rather, the first moment. So, um, yeah, check that out. I think that's going to do it for today's episode of this show. You can find much more about everything that we talked about at SlashFilm.com. Uh, Slash Film Daily is published every weekday, bringing the most exciting news from the world of movies and TV, as well as deeper dives into the great features you can find on the site. You can subscribe to the show on Apple, Overcast, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns, and mailbag topics to us at bpearson at slashfilm.com. Make sure to leave your name and general geographic location in case we mention your email on the air. Don't forget to take a minute to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That does help us out a lot. Tell your friends about the show any way you can. Thanks so much.